Uh, I guess we'll get started. So uh, good morning, everybody. Today's lecturer would be uh, Dr. Uh, ming Yuan Ji. Uh, so if you have any questions, remember to write them in the Q&A section. And I also want to make a quick announcement that there will be no lecture uh, next week. So next week is our little break, and then we'll come back after the week after that. All right, uh, Dr. ming Yuan, it's all you. OK, uh, thank you, Sal, and thank you, Dennis, our other panelists. And I'm very happy to be here to give a very brief introduction about the actual imaging. So my name is Ming Yuanji, and I'm the beamline scientist at the National Lab, uh, Brookhaven National Lab at the Light Source 2. So today, I would like to make a very kind of um, uh, a description about the, what's the actual imaging. And uh, hopefully after these lectures, you will understand some basic ideas and basic concepts of the extra imaging. And with these knowledges, and you can choose the techniques, the suitable techniques for your own research purpose. And hopefully in the near future, we can see you in the light source and you will be the very valuable user for us. Okay. So when we're talking about the imaging, so what would come to your mind first? So to me, it's something like uh, I take a Photoshop, a, fo a photograph on a landscape. But in scientifically, there's uh, also all kinds of image techniques using all the wavelengths we can have from the very short wavelengths like gamma rays to all the long wavelengths like the, the wireless radio, um, radio, radio waves. So here just to show some examples of, of the, the scientific images we can have by using different wavelengths. Uh, like the center image. So this is uh, the, the green gene using the vis visible light. We can see the, all the details about the cells. And also we can use the, the IR, the infrared uh, wavelength to look at the thermal uh, of the object. Right now it's very powerful and useful for this uh, COVID-19 period. So we can detect temperature of the people. Also, we can use the radar to look at the centimeter uh, this is a centimeter wavelength to look at the, the landscape of our Earth and our all the architectures. Of course, do you know what this one? So this is the, the first picture snapshot of the black hole. It's a very it's a kind of milestones. So we also so this we use the submillimeter the wavelength to to get some kind of a uh, complicated uh, calculation to simulate the result we get from interference of the submeter wavelengths uh, um, waves. And of course, we can use even longer wavelengths like the centimeter ones to track the people around the, the space. So this is use Wi-Fi signals. So we can get the tomography, which means the 3D distribution of the object. And to the short wavelengths, we also have the, the UV, the ultraviolet wavelengths. So this is one picture of the Saturn. So the color indicates the distribution of the eyes. So we can know, okay, there's some eyes around the, the, the Saturn rings. And of course we can use the X-rays. We do a lot of X-ray chest test. And we also even short wavelengths like gamma rays and the pistron emission tomography. So this is just the imaging show the tomography, the reconstruction of our head. So it's helpful to de detect some of uh, uh, the male functions, the cells in our head, like Alzheimer's disease. We can show the different distribution of certain uh, signals. Okay, so for why X-ray imaging is very important, especially in the research, because the X-ray imaging is a kind of multimodal image techniques, which means they have, we can detect the multiple signals from X-rays and do some computations, do some manipulations. We get all kinds of signals, all kinds of information from the material and the object. So roughly, we can divide the actual image into two major sub uh, domains. The first one, I, I call the full field imaging. It's just like the, the CT we do in the medicals, medical check. So, so the, the, the top one is just a projection view of the X-ray imaging. So you, you see through our skull, but when we do the CT, we get the internal structure of our head. So we can see all the details about the nervous and all the, uh, the tissues inside. 
And the additional, in addition to the full field imaging, we is called a scanning imaging. So scanning imaging, what we use is that we focus the beam to a tiny spot and the rust scan the object and the collect signals from that object. So for example, the colorful image show here, we just collect the X-ray fluorescence signals and different color is sold to different elements. So there's a beautiful maps of a leaf. So we can see the uh, concentration of the arsenic at the edge of the leaf. And in the center, there's a more calcium and the potassium. And of course, apart from the fluorescence, there's also we collect the uh, uh, scattering signals, which is more abstract, but this also have a lot of information inside. So this is just a, a demonstration of how the uh, scattering signal looks like, like a very kind of regular patterns. And from those patterns, we can understand and derive what's the, the crystal strings, what's the orientation of the crystal, and what's the stress inside. So this, this kind of combination signals give us very rich information about our research object. So in the, in the following slides, and I will introduce, uh, give you kind of uh, a description, some kind of mathematic description about these uh, imaging techniques. So this is just an outline. So we will introduce a concept and we will uh, go to more about the full field imaging, these lectures. And I will also give a very brief introduction about scanning microscope. And for this uh, part, I think more, there's more details, uh, more like more details on the next lectures. And also I will give some of the, uh, the current frontiers uh, and uh, there's are open uh, questions and uh, we would like to address in the future. So the first concept I would like to show is the beam material interactions. So we know that the photons are wave particle duality, not only photons, but also electrons. So when the interaction of the photon to materials is very complicated. So we can extract the different kind of signals and uh, from these interactions. For example, when a photon hits the inner shell of electrons, the way the photons can still pass through this object, which we get the transmissional or scattering signals. And during the same times, because the, in, the core uh, electron has been excited, it leaves a core, which is an unstable state, that all the electrons above and above the high energies will jumping back, which generate a fluorescent signals. That's what we get the X-ray fluorescence uh, map. Of course, uh, the electron can, can flee away the, the material, generate the, the photon electrons. That's XPS, which we know a lot in our research. And uh, we, and since this wave-like particle-like uh, the property, so the photons, if it's more wave-like, these properties we usually use for the transmission signals. And this is mostly used for full field image. And for particle-like properties, like the, the, the jumping back of the electrons and generate individual photons, we use for scanning microscope, like the fluorescent signals. And uh, we also note that different materials have different characteristic features of this absorption, absorption with different energy of uh, photons. So this creates a very rich for information about the, the material, uh, material properties, electronic properties. Like first, what's the element it is? Second, what's the, the electron coordination inside, which corresponding to the oxygen state? and whether it's kind of uh, 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 in a matter state or not. So there's, so we can make use, we want to make use of this information for the research. Okay. So the second concept I would like to introduce is about the free space propagations. So I think uh, in our high school, we know that a very famous experiment is called Young's double slit uh, experiment. So when a plane wave hit on a on, on a on a screen with two opening with two openings, the wave not just pass through straight uh, in a straight line, 
but instead it create interference patterns like the, the, the red color shows. There's a, 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 a variation of the signal intensity and variation in the space. So how we treat this uh, phenomenon mathematically? So we introduce the, the Higgins Fresnel principle. So in this principle, the Higgins suggests that uh, every point uh, from a wave, point, wave front, which from the, the opening, is a secondary source of uh, spherical waves. So we can, we can divide the opening into a lot of secondary source. And then we do a superposition of this spherical wave, and then we propagate to a screen. That's the signal we get. So this is just a show uh, animation. So here we have kind of six to seven uh, uh, the individual points. Of course, you can put more in the simulation to simulate the propagation of the waves through our slits. And uh, to, uh, in, in a schematic drawing, so, so in the left, in this picture, that's the represent the position of our slit, basically our object. So we define this position to be Z equals zero. So Z is a direction of the light propagations. So Z, Z equals zero means the, the wave just after the object. And what we are interested in is that how to get and how to calculate the wave at the distance of Z equals L. So according to the Higgins uh, the principles, this is just uh, adding up the sum of all the individual spherical wave at each point of uh, epsilon and eta, which is located in the object plane. And we sum up and have some coefficient, which is uh, need more complex uh, uh, mathematical tools like the green functions. We will not go to the details, but we will make use of this formula to derive more fundamentals understanding about the propagation. Okay, so in this formula, the R equals the distance from the individual point in the object plane to the detailed plane, like this is R. And uh, we expand it to a square root of the square, uh, the square times the, 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 the offset of in the X direction and the offset in the Y direction. So that's uh, how we uh, define the R. And I think this directly make use of this equation is very difficult. We need to make some approximation to be treatable in uh, analytical mathematical ways. So first, uh, let's do the first uh, approximation like this way. We put the Z outside and get the formula this one. So if the square part like X minus epsilon divided by Z, if this part is very small compared to one, like approaching to zero, we can approximate this uh, complex uh, square root part into a linear part. Then the distribution, in terms, uh, the, the, the wave distribution in the detected plane is simplified into this way. So this formula will be used a lot throughout the lectures and we will see how to make use of this formula to, to derive all the information we can wish we, we need to have. So, so there's actually the two perspectives to look at this equation. The first perspective is called a convolution. So uh, I'm not sure if you have learned in or uh, know this convolution idea. So a convolution is a formula in this way. The object function u, which times uh, uh, the convolution kernel like this way, which is the offset of the your uh, the coordinates and take a negative, and then do the summation, basically the integration to get this one. So, if we reformulate, rearrange this formula, and uh, make this part to be h denoted by h x y, then the u x y is basically a function, a convolutional of this convolution of this uh, propagator, hx, with your object function. And the very 
useful uh, information or useful formula for the convolution calculation that the convolution in the real space is equaling to a product of, of their uh, components into a Fourier space. So here is the convolution of U and H. If we take a Fourier transform of U, get this component, and take, if, take a Fourier transform of H, get this one, then the, the U, the outcome of U, the Fourier transform of the outcome U equals the Fourier transform of the object function times the Fourier transform of the, of the uh, propagator. So in this way, we eliminate the use of the compli complicated integration to a simplified uh, multiplication. And specifically, this H X Y we define as a Fresnel propagator. And this, the nice of the propagator that there's an analytical, analytical uh, formula derivation of its Fourier transform. So Fourier transform of H equal to this exponential one. It's very simple. It's very simple. Okay, then let's look at the a second perspective of this formula. So again, we expand this square into individual part and put the, the quadratic phase uh, x, y, which has nothing, uh, nothing to do with integration. We extract it into the front and then leave the rest uh, into integration. And if you look at carefully about the integration, it's nothing but just the Fourier transform of this function. So, so, so front half make another approximation in that if the z, which is distance from your object and a detector is large, then these terms almost vanish to one. Then the u, x, y, the output is simply a proportional to the Fourier transform of u, x, y, a u, eta, theta. So let's, let's give us a very fundamental understanding of how the way propagate. Basically, if I have a small object and I put a wave of a plane waves into the object, what we get from a very far away is just a Fourier transform of that object. Okay, then the question is that how far is far we define as a far field and how near is, is near we define as a near field. So people uh, have another number called first number, which has formula of the f equals a squared time uh, minus, uh, divided by lambda z. So a is a feature of your object and z is a distance from detector to your object. So if f is much, much less than one, which means z is very large, this is valid for the front, front, half, front half approximation. So the image is just the, the free transform of the object. But if for f are very close to one, it's near field. So the front snail approximation make, uh, become valid, just like the form, this formula become valid. But if f is much, much larger than one, so which means z is very, very close, very, very small, that detects very close to an object. In this, in the, in this sense, even the first narrow approximation doesn't hold because this term is not approaching zero. So we need another different method called angular special method. So this one, I will not uh, talk details in this class, but uh, I have the materials. So after class, you can read. And also there's a very nice channel, YouTube channels to see the explanation about the angular spectral method. So here just uh, the, the propagation and simulation to see how the beam propagated through an aperture like the disk here with 20 microns. And for example, if the Z is 0.1 millimeter very close, what we can detect from screen is almost a replica of your object. But when Z goes far and far, we can see more and more fringes shows up on the edge and finally, at a very large distance, the, the image we get from detector is no more, nothing that uh, like the, 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 the image we can get from the, the object. 
So it's totally different. But we can make use of that information in our imaging and derive more and more rich information inside. So the third concept I want to introduce is the, how the beam interacts with the sample. Previously, we, we know that after slit, we already know how to calculate the beam propagated from z equals zero to z to the L. But before z equals zero, there's an interaction between the, between the beam and the object. So different materials have different kind of dielectric constant, which is n. So it, the, this n has three, uh, the two components, important components, the delta and the beta. The delta, delta is related to the phase change of the object we interact with the beam. And the beta is more related to the absorption. So we introduce a transmission, fun transmission function, which is just exponential of the wavelength times the, the direction constant in, uh, integrated into the, the beam propagation, mass, uh, propagation uh, uh, directions. And then we expand it into this ones, and we get the Tx equals a, a, a coefficient times e uh, exponential of the uh, phi. So phi in the, uh, encode the phase difference when the beam propagated into the material. And the A is the amplitude, which is more related to the absorption, the attenuation of the X-ray. So then we can treat the aperture, actually as a special object. With the, in the aperture, there's the empty in the, in the middle and uh, and the outside, uh, it will block light totally. So that means the beta equals uh, infinity, which means the, the absorption coefficient is very, very large. And delta equals zero, which means it doesn't change the phase of your beam aperture. Which, so this n gave a transmission function of the one and the zero, which one in the aperture part in the middle of the opening and zero in the other areas. So this is just a visual guide of how the materials goes into material, uh, the beam go, go to the material. So after being transformed into the, 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 the transport, um, goes through the material, it changes amplitude, which is due to attenuation of the X-rays, that's more related to the beta. And also we can see that the phase also changed. So this phase difference is more related to the delta. So for X-rays, uh, we can see that the wave accumulated less of the interface. And it, it really reflects how few cycles of wave has go through to get the same particular point in space, like this, compare this line to this line. So, so that, that's the very basic uh, three concepts. Another concept is that the small different, small object will sketch a large angle for the photons. So it's very like, it's very like to the Bragg laws we have learned. So if you look at the formula of the Bragg laws, A sine theta, the periodicity A, some theta equals M lambda. So for small periodic structure, like small object, small A, we get very large sine theta because N lambda is a constant. So small object get a lot, uh, a large angles. This give us a concept that if we to collapse at a large angle, otherwise the small jet will be blurred. We cannot see from the image. So this is just a simulation the, uh, to test the pattern. The, the test pattern. So the, the lower row shows the in, uh, Fourier transform of this one, which just show how the so it's a simulator, the, the far field the propagation, right? Remember in the from half approximation at the Z equals very large, the image we get is just a Fourier transform of your object. So this is a Fourier transform of the object. If we have another aperture, aperture there's a clip away the signal from outside, just leave in the center, center part. We can see the reconstructed image is a little bit blurred. So if you look at the, 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 the lower part, the three lines get merged together compared to the, the raw image. And if we remove more and more information from, uh, from the scattering, the high angle scatterings, we got even blurred. 
So this really demonstrates that the small objects scale to high angles because in free space, the center is zero angle and the away from the center, which means scale to a high angle. And another one we would like to say is about tomography. So tomography is, uh, we, we heard a lot in, in the CT that the computer tomography, right? Used in medical, uh, medical examination. And it, it helps, it gives the, the algorithm to reconstruct the object and see through object, look at the internal structure. So, so this gives a very famous theorem called the Fourier slice theorem. So an uh, object in the, in the detection, what we detect is not a 3D object, what we detect is a projection, the integrated signal from the object at all angles. And uh, if you look at the signal, like the blue curve, if we take a Fourier transform of these blue curves, and in the Fourier space, this Fourier transform of the blue curve is exactly the signals we get from a Fourier space at the angle of the same of, of, of the sign. So, so we know that for uh, an object in real space and in a free space, they are one to one correspondence, which means that if we have a, a, a full distribution of a Fourier, trans, uh, Fourier uh, signals in free space, we can do an inverse Fourier transform and get back to the, the object in real space. So in this way, for the tomography, we just take the image at all different angles and different angle signals gives the, uh, try to fill out the Fourier space at different angles. After fill out the Fourier space in a 2D distribution and we do an inverse Fourier transform, we get your, the real space object. So, but the but difficulties for directly applying this Fourier size theorem is that we never get a full, uh, full fill out of a Fourier space because we have limited angles. And also in Fourier size C C theorems, we are look at the, we actually using the, the, the polar coordinate, which means uh, the, the pixels on each, on each point of this uh, blue line is not has an integer coordinate in a grid XY coordination systems. So we need to do kind of interpolation for the for numerical numerical uh, reconstruction. But this uh, interpolation gives a lot of error that directly apply this free size theorem is very difficult. That's why people have to um, think about the different uh, alternative methods like the filter back projection, third uh, MLEM. So all this state art uh, um, uh, method have been applied to reconstruct the, the 3D object. Okay, so after this uh, basic concepts, we go to real the imaging and for imaging, we look at the full field imaging. First, we look at imaging without any lens just a direct look at the propagation of your, your beam through the material. So there are two kinds of mechanisms to form the, the image. First, we make use of the absorption, which is attenuation of the X-ray from the materials, which is very related to the, uh, to the beta. And second one is the phase contrast. It's more related to the delta in the dielectric constants, if, we, if you remember. Just like the, the, the delta is a phase and beta is uh, attenuation, the absorption. So for absorption contrast, we see that we want to make use of the A, which is this part. So when we detect a wave, what we detect is not the, the, the wave front, but instead we detect uh, intensity. So intensity is a square of the, the, the wave front. And we expand this formula and derive by this I zero times the a square. So I zero is intensity of the incident beam. So in this formula, we can see that the information we get is only the A, but for this uh, exponential part, the, 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 the non-imaginary part, after do the modulation, this part disappears. So 
we don't have any information from the face, but we only have the information from the from this attenuation beta, which is A. So, but also we make sure that the detector should be very, very close to the to a sample. Remember in previous simulation, if it is far away, this will give in some interference. But if you want to really look at the object, the shape, the morphology, we need to put the detail very close to the sample. So this is exactly what we did in the X-ray chest. We put our chest against the detector as close as much. I think the doctor asked you to push hard to the chest to the detector. And then we get a very clear image of your internal the body. And we also know that different material have different kind of absorption coefficient, like, uh, like just like the, the curve showed here. So attenuation lens indicates how, um, how so attenuation lens, which means that if the signal I0 decreased to the one, decreased to the uh, one over E of the original signal, that's attenuation lens. So different material like the water, which have very large attenuation lens, which means it the, the extra, after the X-ray go to the water, it doesn't absorb a lot. It can penetrate a kind of a, a 10,000 micrometer thick water without uh, losing a lot of signals. But if you look at uh, the hard material like metal, the copper nickel, we can see that uh, X-ray can only penetrate about 10 microns at a certain energies, which is much, much less than water. That means for soft material, like a biological material, which is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the 10 keV signal is, is big enough. We can penetrate a, a very thick chunk of the, the body, the soft material. But for hard material like metals, oxides, condensed matter uh, materials, uh, this uh, high KV, the 10 KV only goes very thin layers. In that, but good thing is that for X-rays, we have very, we, we are tunable of X-ray. Uh, so we can go very, very high energy, like 100 and 20, 200 KV. So in that sense, we can use X-ray to examine metal parts, like the, like the engines, like the, the, the bulk piece, we can all see through. So X-ray is really powerful compared to visible light because it can penetrate the, the, the hard materials. Okay, so this is just a different, uh, another uh, further derivation of this uh, absorption coefficient. So what we get is I, is a detect signal, is attenuation of your original signal of I zero. So this is just exponential decay. So if we make a log of this formula like this way, so the signal from the log is directly proportional to attenuation. So that's how we make use for the, to get the tomography reconstruction. Remember in the previous one, the Fourier slide series, we make, we, what we do is not direct the, the signal I, but the, the attenuation mu. So here we go to some real examples. So this example, is a steel treated by, treated by the, the plasma spray of tungsten on top. So we can see that the different material like a steel and the tungsten have different contrasts because we know that different material have different attenuation coefficient. That's why give a different the, the signal we get from detector. So after reconstruction, we can get the 3D distribution of the steel, which is for example, here is the top one, steel very condensed plates but into the sputtering part, we can get a lot of the voids with the pores. And uh, afterwards, uh, if we further sputtering tungsten, we get a very dense part of a, a tungsten, we get the, the bottom part. So in this way, we can examine how this procedure, the experimental procedure, affect the morphology of your final products and make it, give people the idea to how to improve their your technique. The second example is the, uh, is the 3D laser uh, the printing. So 3D laser, 3D laser printing is very useful to make a complex materials with arbitrary uh, geometry. 
com compared to a conventional manufacturer tools. But in 3D printing, there's a lot of fundamental understanding uh, which is still missing. So people understand, want to understand how the 3D printing happened during the, the printing process. In this printing process, it's a very, very short times. It's about kind of less than milliseconds. So we need a very fast image technique to capture the evolution of this three, the printing process. And here, just show one of the movie to see the printing process. Oh, I found the move. Sorry. Sorry, Len. Yes. Well, unfortunately, I failed to play the movie. But the idea is that uh, when we when we do the 3D printing, we found a split of a tiny spots that uh, fly away from your printing space. And these tiny spots really cause uh, a degradation of a surface. You can see this. Previously, if everything goes well, the printing surface should be very smooth. But after printing, if this happens, this will re-solidify and drop onto a metal surface, creating a, a dense or a peel. So this uh, roughness gives the degradation of your printing. So then people need to fine tune the procedure, the laser power, the, the speed of the printing to try to remove this kind of uh, the spill. Okay, so next uh, we want to show you that we can also take advantage of the energy tunability for the X-rays. Since the different material have the characteristic absorption uh, coefficient. So, so if we make, so if we use one energy of X-rays and we find that it doesn't give very good contrast, maybe we can try a different energy. So this is just an angiograph show the, the blood vessel filled with iodine. So, so before the iodine edge, we can see the attenuation uh, coefficient very small. But if after if we put the X energy is higher than the absorption edge of iodine, the, the, the iodine will absorb more a lot more X-rays. This gives as a big contrast, a very dark contrast of the vessel. So we can, if we do uh, divide uh, the, 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 the subtraction from the before and after, we can clearly see where the blood vessel it is, because blood vessel is already filled with iodine, the, so some of iodine materials. And also if we do the after months before, we can see the bright contrast. Okay. So we already talked about the absorptions. The next, we want to talk about, about the phase contrast, making use of the phase component of this formula. Again, this is a formula here we have. So how to make use of phase? And the first question is uh, how the material responds to the X-rays and how the phase changes after X-ray penetrates into your material. So this is the wavefront of the X-rays of the material, it has two components in the Z direction, which is the propagation in the X-ray, and also a deflection in the X part. And the, we categorize a wave using the wave vector K. And if we categorize it, the two components of X and Z can be explicitly written out. And the, and the deflection angle actually is related to how much of the X component and how much of the Z component. And when this diffraction is very small, the sine alpha equals to the alpha, which corresponding to the X component divided by the, the original K component. So K is the wave vector in a vacuum, which is two pi over lambda. So if you look at the formula, this delta alpha equals to the X component 
X component diffraction divided by K. So K is a constant. So that phi, uh, phi a partial derivative of phi of X is really is uh, proportional to alpha, which means the diffraction of X rays is really to the phase gradient of the material. So there are three types of phase contrast image method to detect what's the phase of phi it is. So the first one is analyzer based one. Second one, we use make use of grating. The third one, just direct propagate. So we will introduce one by one uh, briefly. If you are interested, you can go to all the, the details into our papers as listed in the, in the slides. So analyze based on face contrast imaging. We what we use we need what we need is a crystal. So the crystal is a periodic structure like a silicon wafer. It so if we put the the geometry uh, the, the the direction of the wafer in a bright angle. The direct bright angle it will deflect the the incident beam without any uh, um, the, the distortion. But if this object inside the beam, after, after the beam penetrated into the object, it will deflect a little bit. Then the, the beam afterwards will be away from the black angle of your crystal. It will give a very different intensity and very different uh, the position. So by making informations, we can try to retrieve what's the face of the object it is. And this technique is very sensitive to the, the first derivative of phi. You remember here, the diffraction is sensitive to the face uh, gradient, first uh, derivative. Okay, so when a beam passes through a crystal, like geometry shown here, it's actually not a very, like uh, the, the black law shows, not a, a direct, it's not a very, uh, mm, the signal is has actually have certain distribution. But we can see the slope is very steep. Close, very close to the, the ideal, uh, ideal theta, they give the intensity. Away from the theta, the signal drops very, very quickly. So the width of this signal, it's called Darwin width. And since we have two the first uh, uh, crystal and second crystal. So the, so, the, so the signal from this one actually is a combination of your Darwin waves of first crystal and Darwin waves of crystal give a symmetric peak like this one. Then what we do in the experiment is that we rock the analyzer center crystal a little bit. Then the signal will vary from the peak signal to the shoulder signals. So in principle, if there's no diffraction of the materials, these two signals, I left and I uh, low and high will be equal to each other. But if there's an uh, object, it, it deflects the, uh, your, your waves away from the, uh, the, away from the original path, then I left and I right will be different because the, the rocking angle is different. And uh, by doing this one, we can actually calculate how, what the theta it is, how the, def uh, how the diffraction of your signal it is. And this diffraction is directly proportional to the phase gradient. So this is just a one example of the uh, nylon fiber. So nylon fiber is the make of the carbon hydro uh, carbon based materials are very light. And if you look at the radiograph, which is just absorption contrast, we can see that the image quality is really poor. The contrast is very low. And if the nylon fiber is very tiny, like a 0.1 millimeter, we barely see nothing in the absorption coefficient, in the absorption contrast image. But if we do the analyzer based uh, uh, imaging, the contrast, what we can get is very clear to see the fiber structure, the wall of the fiber and internal is an empty space. And even for 0.1 millimeter, we can clear still see the, the, the where the where the, the position of the nylon fiber, although the internal structure is missing. 
but this is really an advancement compared to the, the previous introduced absorption uh, conscious image. So, so there's a many advantages of the analyzer based imaging. So it's very sensitive to the angular, which means angular are the, the deflection of your X-rays, which relate to the phase gradient of the materials. And it has a very, have found very broad uh, interest in the medical communities because uh, medical stuff like our body is most of the soft materials like vessels. And also we make use the X-ray source, uh, not even non-coherent because we just detect the reflection, deflection of X-rays is not dealing with any coherence of the X-ray source. So it reduces the, the requirement of the quality your, about your the source, the beam source. And also, it's also getting more and more attention because it, we can use different X-ray energies. We're not specified when X-ray energies, we can use a poly, polymatic X-rays with a broad range from the low energy to high energy. But it also has some disadvantages because the, the spatial resolution is really limited by the, the crystal, by the crystal, uh, the, your analyzer crystal. Just like this one, just like the crystal, it's really sensitive to how much diffraction you get detected. And, uh, and uh, because these diffractions only in, happen in one direction, happened when in the direction, direction like in rocking, uh, rocking in this way, right? Rocking in this way. We do, ha we do not have any information rocking in the perpendicular way. So it's only sensitive to 1D object, but the 2D implementation is more challenging. But, and also the efficiency to detect the signal is pretty low because when we look at the high angle, high angle signals, high angle signals like this one, the signal become very, very low. So it's hard to detect if, the, if uh, your phase gradient is tiny. Okay, the second uh, phase contra image technique is called uh, uh, the grating based. So grating based image is really taking advantage, uh, taking advantage of the tailboard effects. So I will not go to details, but we will just show the so the result. So if we have a grating like this one with a periodic A, when a beam pass through it, it will form a similar, it will form a second image at a different lengths, at a discrete lens. For example, at the lens of a, a capitalized called the ZT, it's a cardboard lens, it replica the feature of your object. And at, uh, at the half the distance, it also have the same characteristic uh, feature of this one, but the shift by half peer period. If you go to between, the, the object uh, will, will double the frequency. The peer values are reduced at the, at the quarter and the three quarters. So image below just to show the real result of how the grating image looks like. So the figure A is a grating structure. At the at zero distance, we can see the image really show the same periodicity of the grating. But at a different at a one force, we can show, see that there's an additional feature show up. The periodicity become become uh, half. We increase the frequency of the image, and again in the in the in the half of distance, like a zt over two, we see the same periodicity of the structure, but there's a shift of of uh, pi over two, there's a shift. So this phenomenon go on and on. We can use this of technique. What we do is that if we have a sample and put a grating, this sample will have a replica of the itself afterwards, replica of the, of the waveform of the, uh, after G1, the grating. And we use another grating G2 to reanalyze the signal, the waveform signals and, and form on the detector. So G2 usually have the same periodicity or even a half periodicity of the G1. So here just the, the real show. 
uh, and make a, a picture showing how the structure looks like. The beam passes through the object and get deflected by the first grating. And use a sixth crystal to analyze the grating, uh, the, the deflection of these signals and color by CCD camera. So, so why we need to have this uh, analyzer instead of just uh, directly put the CCD in front of this one? Because the deflection of this beam usually is smaller than the pixel size of the camera. So the camera doesn't have the resolution to resolve the, the small deflection. That's why we need to use a set uh, the grating to decouple the, decouple the signal from small uh, deflection. <clears throat> so this is called a phase stepping method. So if you look at details, so you go to this reference. And this is just an example of the grating based uh, uh, phase control imaging. So this is an uh, image of your human brain. So human brains have a, a different, uh, there's not many layers uh, into, your, into our brains. So. If you look at the absorption imaging, you almost see nothing. Very barely seen some very dark shade of this stripe, but uh, anything else is missing. But if you do the grating based phase contrast imaging, we see all the details, like the, the, the white stuff, the white stuff, and the, the, the different layers. And we can reconstruct the 3D object, get the distribution of all the, uh, all the internal uh, the complexities of our brain. The third one we want to introduce is the propagation based fit contrast, which we, need, we don't need any additional hardware we just uh, let the object, uh, put the object into a beam and put a detector afterwards to detect signals. So if this is just a beam line, out, a beam line uh, layout of this propagation-based contrast imaging. So actually beam directly pass through your, your insect, the your object, and we have a scintillator, which converts the X-ray image into a fluorescent, uh, the, the visible light imaging, and collect by the CCD camera. So we directly see through this one. Again, previously we know that the signal from the object actually is a convolution of your, uh, the signal from the detector is a, com is a convolution of your signal right off your object and convolutional convolution with a propagator, the foreign snail propagator. And the, the tilde of the phi represents the, the Fourier transform. So, so we do not go to details of this one. So, the, so if you go to all the mathematical details, what we can get is that the signal from the detector is sensitive to the second derivative of your phase. So it's different from previous one. Previous one for the, uh, for the, the, the grading based as well as the, the other, another one. That previous one is sensitive, to, is sensitive to the first derivative of the phase, but this propagation one is sensitive to second derivative of the phase. Then the question is that how, what's a, what's a, uh, how far should we put a, put a detector? Can we put it uh, the any place? Actually, uh, there's some restrictions which we introduce the concept of the friends in the zone. So suppose uh, we have sitting at the observation point like the, away from the object like L, so we know that if the phase, uh, if the within the half period, the, the lambda, lambda over two, these kind of waves will be constructively, basically this intensity will be adding up. And the interest, if we draw a circle with, uh, a di uh, with a radio of L plus lambda over two, the intersection of this circle with your, your object. Within this region, all the wave after, after in this region will constructively uh, adding up to the opposite point, which means we get signals. But if the signal from the second zone, I uh, have a certain intersection from this zone, like the, we draw a second circle with a radius of L plus lambda. So in this region, these signals will be out of phase of the, from the signal from the first zone, uh, first uh, uh, the Fresnel zone. So, it, so that means that if the object is sitting, have extended the size, go to there, 
go to this region, and this signal will cancel out the signal from your center point. So, which, so in that sense, we should have a restriction of a particle size, your object size, and this size should be related to the distance of your detector. That's how we decide uh, what's the distance of L, depending on the size of your object, as well as the wavelengths with, uh, that you, you used. So we can see that uh, different L really have different uh, effects. So if the L is small, what we get, it's really uh, almost uh, uh, re uh, still keep the position, keep the shape of your object. But if you're away, we use, uh, we get the, the Fresnel fringes, which is, this is called inline holography. And if we're really large, we get the Fraunhoff diffractions, which is just a diffraction pattern of your object. So they just show two comparison of these interactions at a very close distance. The object almost see very clearly see the features. And the most importantly, the, the edge of this object has been enhanced because this technique is sensitive to the derivative, second derivative of the object. And the second derivative the very is changed a lot in is very large in the edge. That's why we get the edge enhancement. If we go far away, go far away, we get a lot more and more fringes, which we can make use of it, which we will discuss later. So this is just another uh, example showing how the propagation method applied to the uh, uh, um, um, a biomaterial like the out hat. So uh, again, as a comparison, we first look at how the absorption contrast looks like. It's very faint because it's soft material, the attenuation very is small. And if we look at the face contrast imaging, we can see uh, all the details inside and we have very nice resolution about two microns so uh, this kind of uh, centimeter scale imaging. And there's another one. Uh, sorry. So this is just another Beatles. So people are uh, trying to look at uh, how the Beatles uh, are in the, in the, in the brassing. So we can see this is a lot of bubbles inside. So if the image plays well, we can see the bubbles is in and out by by the pressure change of this, uh, the throat of the, the ants. So it's very powerful look at the, the live, live insects without the additional damage. This is just another example showing the heads of an, another beetles. So by looking at the by segmented imaging, so the, the, the bio people can segment into different uh, tissues and look at the structures, distribution, and the male functions if they have. And uh, in addition to the biomaterials, soft materials, so it's also powerful to look at hard materials so like uh, alloys. So, so this experiment really showed the in-situ work of the uh, evolution of the dendrite goals. So previously, at the, uh, with the alloy, this is the, the aluminum copper alloys. So we can see a lot of the, the enrichments of alumina in certain spatial distribution. And uh, if we increase the temperature, it basically the, uh, the alloys start to melt and these features start to disappear and become more and more uniform. At high temperature, we can see a very uniform distribution of uh, the aluminum and the copper. But if we slowly cooling down, we can see this kind of dendrite start to show up and start to grow again. And at the room temperature, it forms a very, almost identical features of the, your, your starting material. Yeah, this, so sorry, this is another animation show, really show the, the, the procedure of the dendrite growth. I'll skip this one. Okay. So previously, we already tell that uh, the, the face contrast image is very sensitive to the face, but we only do the, the qualitatively. We just look at the morphology. But if how but the question comes is, is there any way that we can really retrieve the face of the materials? So, so this kind of uh, quantitative analysis, is that possible? The answer is yes. 
So let's look at, let's look back to the office, what the signal we get. What we get from detector is the intensity of the beam. Because in sentence, it takes the modulation of the of the wave of the wave wave front. Uh, so we are losing, we lose the 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 phase component of phi because this is in the exponential part and the ticket modulation this goes to one. So we lose these terms no matter what the phase it is. So so people have derived a way to retrieve the phase. If you look at the formula carefully, the transmission of function t, these components here, actually can be expanded to, can be approximate to a linear function if this phase change is small. So the Fourier transform of this transmission functions equals to a delta function. So the e, e, uh, the one, if it took the Fourier transform, it's equal to delta functions and also the Fourier transform of the phi and the mu. And if we do make some arrangement of this, uh, uh, this formula, uh, this formula, Fourier transform formulas, we can see that the, the Fourier transform of the downstream waves is, can be written as these equations, and this mu is related to the absorptions. This chi encodes the phase part. And, and when things we get the, so this is just the plug this, in, uh, plug this uh, formula back, get this one, okay. And okay, so this is a Fourier transform. So what we get is, uh, but we, we want to get a relationship between the intensity image with respect to your material, the phase. So we do our inverse Fourier transform of this F, get this one. So all the Fourier transforms, so all the multiplication part became a convolutional part, right? So the, the capital phi is a, is a Fourier transform of the phi and sine cos is just sine cos So we take an inverse Fourier transform of sine cos and all the components do the same mathematical manipulations, get this formula. Okay, then that's the fun part. So we get the intensity, which is a square of the, the modulation, a modular of this uh, transform uh, wave front. So we get this one, still, the con still a convolution uh, formula. But if we take a Fourier transform of this signal, we, we convert this convolution to a, per, uh, to a multiplication back. So, that means uh, the Fourier transform of your signal from detector is really an evolution of your phase of a material and the attenuation of your materials. And they are modulated by your sine cosine and cosine cosine. And the cosine is, uh, uh, is related to the, the propagation distance Z. So this is just to show how these modulations uh, form theoretically so the sine and the cosine on this one. So at a different z, we have a different intensity, right? If you plug a different z, we get a different i. That means if I can collect signals at different, at different position of z, and by making use of this formula, we can retrieve the exact, exact component of the phi. So that's really how we do the experiment. We take an image at different positions, Z1, Z2 to Zn, and we want to minimize the, the measurement with respect to the calculation. The calculation is nothing but just this formula. So we minimize it and use a least square rule, a least square uh, minimization method. We get it. We can derive the phi, the phase of material analytically. So this is just a Fourier transform of the, of the phase components. And after this one, you do a reverse Fourier, trans reverse Fourier transform, you get the, the real space distribution of your, your phase component. So that's the real experiment. We take an image at the, at the 0.03 meter away and the 0 0.21, 0 0.51, 0 0.9. So we can see the image get the uh, get more fringes showing up. And by making use these four, four images, four distance images, plug back into this formula, 
we retrieve the face of the materials. That's of the fibers. So very clear, so very high, uh, high resolutions and very sensitive to very uh, small feature. Okay. Uh, so I think maybe we can take a break. After break, maybe we can talk about more about the, the imaging using lens. All right, so uh, let's take a 10 minute break. So we'll be returning back at uh, 10, 18 New York time and uh, 18 minutes past the hour on your local time. If you have any questions, write them in the Q&A section and we will answer them after the break. Thank you. Hi, Sal. Can you see my animation now? Yes, I can see the uh, crystal. Floor. Okay, okay, great, great. Okay.
Hi, Sal. Shall we start? Yes, let's start. Um, there are no questions right now, so we could just keep going. Okay. So um, before we go f further, uh, I think I fixed the how to play the animation. So maybe you have a look. So previously we see uh, we can use an in situ experiment to see the dendritic growth of aluminum into the aluminum copper alloy due to solidification. So initially this is in a melting state. So all the aluminum and the copper is uh, in, almost in a liquid state, so very uniform. But after losing, uh, after reduce the temperature, the melting point becomes solidified, and we can see the growth of aluminum dendrites. So this, uh, yeah, so very clearly to see. And next one is another uh, animation. So the dendrite growth, the propagations. You can see the dendrite become larger and thicker after when the temperature further goes uh, further goes down. Okay, almost finished. Okay, so okay, let's back to our track to see. The next uh, imaging, which is use uh, use lens. So uh, comparing with the previous uh, imaging without lens, using lens, what, what we can gain is uh, the resolutions. So previously without lens, we if you remember in the uh, in the in the phase contrast imaging or attenuation imaging, the relation about in micron scale, two micron or, or even higher or even larger. But uh, if we use lens, we can go to nano imaging. So we can into nanometer scale imaging uh, object. So for lens, what we know is uh, what kind of optics we need for this purpose. So in optical microscope, we use different glass, uh, glass uh, lens made, making of glass. So the, the glass lens can focus the light, can bend the light very easily by design the geometry. But for X-ray, it's very hard to bend the X-ray because the refractive index, especially the delta, which is a phase, change of phase that's sensitive to the, to the diffraction of light, is very, very small. So it's very hard for, for using, for using all, all the materials we have to bend the X-rays, just like what we, have, what we do in the uh, visible light. So what we do, instead of a direct bend the X-rays, we make use of the face. So we make some of the, the, the waves uh, interference constructively. Some of the place, uh, some of the location of the, the face uh, that interfere uh, uh, disconstructively. So that's why we, we get some uh, folks uh, light. So the very famous or very well used optics is called zone plate. It's an alternative ring of the, diff the material with different materials. A different material. So this kind of structure will do a construction of the uh, the bright part, and uh, the deconstructed part has been blocked by the other material. So we can get a focus light. And the second one, an, an, another focus optics is called a compound refract lens. It's also uh, uh, you by using the, by making use of the face when propagating into materials. So we have a different geometry like this one. So here we will focus on the zone plate part. And for this zone plate, the first question come to my mind is what's the resolution? Why can we get a high resolution of this zone plate? So when the beam passes through the zone plate, it will deflect at the, at the angle theta. And if we use, and the, the K vectors as we have two components, one component is the parallel to the propagation, which is in the x direction. Another component is in the y direction. It tells how much we bent the, 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 the ray. Because of a certain principle, the delta k times delta x is, cannot be arbitrarily small. 
it must be less, larger than one if you derive from the, from the uh, very uh, from the first principle calculation. That gives us the the resolution in the x direction and y direction. So the in x direction uh, in y direction that really tells what's the resolution limit, and the delta y. Uh, delta x in this part tells what's the depth of focus. That means uh, in what range we can have a clear image without blurring. If the object is larger, is away from the depth of focus, that part will get uh, blurred. So this delta x here defines the size of object. This delta y tells uh, what's the resolution we can get. So, uh, so this is just the, the mechanism of this zone plate, how it works. Remember first, previously, we see this uh, Fresnel zone. The uh, object, the wave come from the first Fresnel zone will constructively, will constructively interfere. But uh, if, if we have uh, extended object, extended wave from the second uh, the Fresnel zone, this part will uh, uh, disconstructively interfere. So we use materials to block this part. Only lots of waves which can constructively interfere pass through the zone plate. That's we have this kind of alternative uh, uh, structure of the zone plate. So, and uh, from the from the design, we can decide what's the what's the, the radius of each zone and what's the What's the thickness of this zone? So very simple mass. We see that we want, according to this uh, picture, we want the, the 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 distance L. We want to this part the R. The, we want to the, the the difference of the path length from L and original one less than equals to lambda over two. So this part will give a beam interfere constructively. By using this formula, we can derive what's the uh, diameter of the zone at different uh, uh, different number n. So first zone, second zone, we can derive what's the radius of this one. And, uh, and uh, more importantly, if we look at the outermost, uh, the very end, the, 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 the the zone very away from the center, the, the, the outermost zone. So this also from the same formula, we can get the delta R, we can get the thickness which is delta R can be written on this formula, which is lambda divided by the numerical aperture divided by two. So numerical aperture is just the sine theta, the, the diffraction angle theta. And we, if we recall the previous slides, we know resolution delta Y equals to this one, and this is just theoretical resolution, but most of the time we do uh, a relaxed, we have a relaxed resolution like that y equals remove the pi. We can get the delta y is almost equals to identical to delta r. That means the resolution of the zone plate is really determined by the ways of the outermost zone. That's why in, 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 in reality, when, when people ma manufacture this zone plate, they want to ma make delta R, the outermost zone, as thin as possible that can increase the resolution. So for state of art, we can have a 15 nanometer delta R that can resolve the image of 15 nanometers compared to the previous one without the lens, image without lens, which have the resolution of, a, of a microns. Here, we directly go to 10 to 15 nanometers. Okay, and for this, uh, although this is a zone plate, it's different from optical lens, but uh, the lens equation still apply to this one, which means the objective distance and uh, the image distance still relate to the focus of the of the, the zone plate. So we can still have the same uh, lens equation, and. Uh, more importantly, we want to say that at the focal length f away from this one, this have a special meaning, which we give a name of a call, uh, called a back focal plane. So in this plane, 
if we put a detector at this plane, what we can collect is, is the Fourier transform of your object. And in the later, we will try to manipulate the, the Fourier space, which manipulates the, 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 the wave on the back foot plane to derive more information. And also, the resolution also depends on the, uh, also the size of zone plate also play a big effect on the resolution. Because if the size of zone plate is very small, it cannot collect the signal scattering from high angle to high angle. So remember, the high angle signals gives signal or uh, gives the high resolution. If the zone plate is small, if we miss the high angle scattering, we also reduce the resolution. So this is also a very important concept. So this is a real setup for the, the transmission actually microscope using the zone plate. So we first uh, pre-focus the light into a sample and as the light, the wave after sample have scattering and by passing through the zone plate, if we get focused back to the image plane and we use the scintillator and use a, another optical microscope, optical lens to magnify the image to get a, a large magnification. So usually for the zone plate, the magnification is about the 40 to 80s. And for the optical lens, we have another magnification about 10. So total magnification can be reached about the 400 to, to 800. And uh, so, so it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, so for example, if we have a kind of uh, a one micron particles, we can resolve into 10, and, and 10 to 20 nanometer resolution very easily. So this is just a one example show the, show the growth of copper into the copper sulfide solutions. So we can see the dendrite growth into solutions by applying the voltage, so we can clearly see the nano, nano scale part. So the scale, so the field of view about the 20 to 40 micron. So if you look at the very detail about the dendrite features, about a few to tens nanometers. And we can also see another example, see the growth of copper, uh, silver on top of copper. So this is a very demonstrative, it's a demonstrative experiment. So the replacement of the silver ions to copper get the silver growth. Because we can, because of the high flux of X-ray, we can do the 3D tomography very fast. Within one minute, we capture the whole 3D volume evolution of this reaction. So at the beginning, we have a bare copper, which is just a mountain-like. And after one minute, we can see some growth of a dendrite, which is silver. And uh, the silver continue grows of two minutes and three minutes. Look at it, looks like a forest that grows on the mountain. And we can do a fourth color to see the growth of dendrite. So very interesting, we can see that at the tip of the copper, there's more growth of silver than the side because at the tip, the, because of the, the large curvature, the, there's a redistribution of the reaction, the, the, the electric field the internal field that gives the growth of the uh, pre preferential growth of the silver on top of the copper. And another example, uh, the build our user use is to examine the, the molten salt. So molten salt uh, is widely used, uh, currently used the, the, the nuclear reactor. So back to 2011, there's a disaster happened on Japan the reactor, the Fukushima uh, uh, reactor. So the accident happens because of the earthquake. So when the earthquake comes and the effect from uh, afterwards, the coolant, the, the electricity stop the, the circulation of the coolant, then the temperature of the reactor core increases tremendously and some of you has leaked into the, the safety guard, which has filled with coolant, and the reactor will radioize the uh, ionize the, the water coolant and generate a lot of hydrogen. 
And when the pressure goes up, build up, the, the hydrogen just exploded and caused a disaster. So after this accident, uh, people think about uh, uh, a safe way to replace the water current using some molten salt. So molten salt is composed of uh, a kind of salt like uh, chlorine, um, uh, the, the potassium chloride or cesium chloride. So this coolant uh, is much safer because uh, it will not generate hydrogen. So there's no way to build up pressure. And also it's, uh, the, this molten salt is very efficient in removing the heat. So that's the development of the, the new generation of the nuclear reactor. So this image shows the reactor built up at the Netherlands using the, the, the melting salt coolant. And also another improvement, another lesson we learned is that they use a new radio source, uh, the nuclear source like uh, the thoriums instead of the uraniums because thoriums is much safer. It can be, can be mixed into another molten salt and feed into a reactor and the reaction can be well, much easier to control compared to the uraniums. So for this kind of molten salt uh, per charge, people want to understand how this molten salt, it, uh, um, to what extent the molten salt is safe, especially for the container. So previously when you use water, we know that steel is very, uh, stainless steel very uh, resisted to the water corrosion. But for molten salt, in, in this steel is uh, good enough for, hold, for holding up the molten salt. So people do the, the in situ experiment to see the effect of molten salt to the container. So in the, in the mimic experiment, we use uh, uh, nickel iron, which is one component in the, the, uh, the container and um, insert this uh, nickel iron, uh, wire into a molten salt. And we elevate the temperature to about 700 degrees C and to see whether there's a corrosion happens. And if you look at image A, there's a pristine wire, it's a uniform uh, diameter. And at high temperature, 700 degrees C, after more than one hour, we can see a slight shrink of this, uh, this wire. Then people test on a different material, put additional chromium into uh, the nickel. So usually in the, in the stainless steel, if we put the chromium, the steel will become more resistant to the water, like even in the sea, the sea salt water. So naively, we're thinking that if we put some chromium into the nickel, it may also get the resistance, uh, more resistant to the reaction into, in the molten salt. In, re in reality, however, the effect is reversed. We can see a lot of void structure built up into this uh, alloy. So this gives people some idea about why this happens. So there's a uh, two kind of different mechanism of this evolution in pure nickel and the nickel doped with chromium. For this doping, for this alloy, actually chromium, chromium is kind of more mobile to nickel, if I understand correctly. So there's a continued dissolution of the chromium at high temperature, dissolved into molten salt, building up, so form a kind of a threshold. Compared to nickel itself, nickel just uh, react from outside to inside gradually. So it's kind of a, a, a smooth reaction from outside to in, inside. But for the chromium part, it's develop a percolation network. More chromium, easy to, uh, chromium is easy to dissolve from a network of holes. So this also gave the research idea that so how to uh, design the material composition people may to try different combination, different combination with different elements to see what's the best way to stop or min minimize the corrosion of this uh, um, corrosion caused by the molten salt. 
Okay, so previously, that's the, the image using lens, using the absorption contrast. But using lens, we can also get the, zone, uh, the face contrast. So if we look at the formula here back again, sorry, we need to look at formula again, again. The transmissional function TXY, again, writing as attenuation part A and also the phase part. And if this material is a weakly uh, X-ray interacting material, which means the diffraction of X-ray is small, the phi here can be written as two components. The first component is phi zero, which is constant, which means there's no diffraction of X-ray. There's no phase change of this phi zero, always keep it there. There's a small fluctuation of delta phi that captures a signal that deflects away from your original propagation. So that's the small change of the phase. Since this phase, this change is very small, we expand it, we do the Taylor uh, expansion, we expand this uh, exponential part into a linear part. Then the signal we collect from the detector is the square of the, of the wavefront and it's a uh, square of the transmission x t, and then plug in this one in back to this formula, we get a square of one plus i delta phi. Because this delta phi is small, so the square of the one plus i delta phi is almost equals to one. Again, we lose the phase information. So very genius idea is that from Zanaki, Fritz Zanaki, is that if we can change the one to the i, then the formula becomes this one. And the, the modulation of this part becomes one plus two phi. So in this sense, the intensity we collect from the detector right now is sensitive to the derivative of the phase. It's very similar to what we have in the previous one, that imaging without a lens, right? But how to change one to the I? So this idea actually won the, the Nobel Prize in physics in 1953. So, so to change the I, to change the I, what we do is that actually what we effectively, we change the one to the E over pi i pi over two, where this term into, uh, equals to i. What does that mean? What it means that this is a component that's being passed through the material without any deflection. So we multiply by another phase factor pi over two, which means we need to shift this being shift the face of this beam by, an, by pi over two. That gives this, uh, that gives these sensitivities, right? But how do we change the face for this component only? Let's look at the Fourier transform again. So Fourier transform tells us that one, the first component of one, if it were Fourier transform is a delta function and this fxy is the component in the Fourier space. Delta xy, that means this component only show up at fx equals fxy equals zero. That means we need to manipulate this part of being with a, Fourier, with a frequency equals zero. This is nothing but just the direct being passed through the material. Without, without a deflection. So if we can separate the, the direct beam away from the deflection beam and add the um, pi over two phase to this direct beam, we get a phase sensitive, phase sensitive image. So look at the diagram here. Previously we know that at the focal back focal plane, that's the Fourier transform of your object, of your, 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 your object weight, right? And we have the 
So if you look at the, the blue arrow, that's the image passes through the sample without any deflection. And this beam after zone plate, it folks to this point. So this is the position of the beam pass through the sample without deflection. So if we add another, another material, like a phase changing material, to change the phase of this part, we get the, we get the phase sensitive image, right? We just need to find the, the, the right materials with design thickness that doesn't change the intensity of the beam, but just adjust the, the, the phase of the beam. So this is really a, a schematic show about the beam line setup. All the components are same, except we have a phase ring. The phase ring changes the, the direct beam, the phase of the direct beam. So this is just an example show the uh, another cancer, uh, the hella cells of the, uh, in the X-ray. So on the absorption contrast image, we see nothing because this is soft materials, the penetrate, uh, also when you mentioned that this is a hard X-ray image, the X-ray image about 8 kV. So the interaction of the X-ray uh, absorption is very tiny, so it's nothing. But if we use the Zernike phase contrast after the insert the phase ring, we see the details. We see the, all the detail inside. So this is the positive Zernike phase is negative Zernike phase. We see uh, the small features inside the halo cell. Okay, so we have all the stuff for the, the basic imaging using and without using lens. The next topic I would like to cover is about the energy resolved imaging. So in addition though, to look at the morphology, we can also derive some element sensitive information from the material by tuning the energy of the incident X-ray. So we know that the, the dielectric constant of material has two components, right? The, the attenuation part, the phase part, and both parts are sensitive to different X energies. Like the iron, it has some characteristic feature about the absorption, about the phase. So, in, so by tuning the instant X energies, we can capture this kind of sensitive information to know what the element it is and what are the, 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 the electronic configuration inside it is. Like the, the X-ray absorption spectrum you have learned in your previous lecture. So for, for, for real experiment, like the TXM, the transmission X-ray microscope in beam lines, we have our energy range around the five to 12 kV, but uh, a different facility, we have different range, can okay? maybe extend to lower one and higher one. So this energy range really cover a lot of uh, uh, materials in the periodic tables, like the transition metal group, and also the rare earth element group. So for all these elements, we can use the extra and we can use the extra image to let, look at the electronic structure of a material, not only the morphology. So then we use called the TXM Zins measurement. So the, in this measurement, we use lens to get a nano scale resolution, but we also tune the X-ray energies. Because the different sensitivities of material to energies, if we tune the energy, we get different contrast. And if you look at the individual pixel into the pictures and assemble them together, we get a spectrum. It's exactly the same as the, the Zin spectrum you get from the conventional uh, Zin's uh, facility, Zin's measurement. So the x, x, x axis is the energy, y axis is the absorption coefficient. But different is different from the conventional zinc measurement that we have spatially resolved zinc. From these images, each individual pixel have a zinc spectrum. If we, our size of image is one uh, k by one k, that means from this measurement we get one k by one k amount of zinc spectrons simultaneously. We know the location is, 
we know the we know the uh, how the the, peak, uh, the spectrum looks like. This is an example showing the this method TXM zinc applied to uh, uh, nickel magnesium cobalt oxide, which is used as a cathode material in the lithium batteries. And we, if you take the measurement across the, the nickel absorption edge, which is eight point three, and analyze the spectrum individually for individual pixel, we can understand the distribution of the ox different oxidation of nickel. So the red means here means the nickel two plus, the green nickel three plus. So we know where the distribution is. In. So we can see these particles, uh, it's kind of very uniform, but some enrichment on this part for more nickel two and this part of more nickel three. And the quality of this signal is pretty good. And this we can also do the in situ experiment, which means that we charge the batteries and at the same time we look at the zinc spectrum to see the evolution of the, uh, the, oxidation, uh, the nickel oxidation state change. So we, we can choose different regions. And we can see for this region from, from previously uh, pristine uh, state to fully charged state, we can see a gradual change of the color indicates a gradual oxidation of this uh, uh, MC, the nickel, uh, nickel magnesium cobalt oxide particles. But for another region, some particle can show a later reaction, like this particle indicated by the arrow. So compared to the surrounding particles, which already show very pink color, this particle still show a lot of kind of the, the blue-like uh, colors, which means the reaction is, uh, is uh, delayed. But if we further increase the, the voltage, that reaction goes up, it catch up. So, so this tells us that even the material is the same in the battery, but there's still non homogeneity in the reactions. This non homogeneity reaction may due to the degradation of the material itself, may also relate to the, your assembly of the battery. Some battery have, some particles have good electronic contact, some are not. These all give us a challenging or ideas to optimize the procedure in making materials, in making batteries. And we can, so previous one, we are just a 2D image, just to look at the projection of the particles. We can also look at the, the 3D distribution of a chemical state by looking at the tomography. So in this experiment, we take a tomography at each X-ray energies. Then we have a 3D voxel distribution and each voxels have a spectrum. Then by analyzing individual voxel spectrons, we get a 3D distribution of the oxygen state. So for this particle, this is a particle after long cycling. So original uh, intact sphere form some cracks and we can see in the cracks, if you look at this spectrum, we see a lot of nickel two. So this is really a side reaction of the crack. So battery scientists know exactly what happens by looking at the image and the idea that how to minimize these side reactions either by coating or prevent the particle be cracked. So this is just the animation see through the particle, not only morphology, but also the distribution of the chemical states inside the, your cracked particle. So from the size view, we do see a lot of enrichment like this one, enrichments of nickel two, this dark region. Also, okay. also we can see, right, this is a crack we are see a lot of green-like uh, color compared to blue-like, which means there's a more nickel two plus on the crack side. There's additional test. So the electrode on the on the, the substrate on the for you, the 3D volume, and also the crack inside. So very clear see the individual particles, individual cracks, and the distribution of different oxygen states of your of your nickel. And also some other materials like the mixture of the solid electrolyte. So because 
uh, battery, people say that the liquid that they tried is not safe, it's easy to catch fire. So the next generation of a battery is to use a solid electrolyte, which doesn't compose, doesn't have any organic uh, components. That means even the temperature goes high, this uh, solid uh, electrolyte will not get exploded. It's much safer. So people synthesize a, a mixture of the electrode, embed the electrode into the electrolyte and want to see how this electrolyte help to stabilize materials and whether the reaction is still uniform or uh, uh, compared to uh, compare the situation in the liquid electrolyte. So we can do a 3D morphology, 3D things better. Okay, so up to now, we have finished all the parts for the full field imaging. So next, I will give a very brief introduction about the scanning microscope imaging. So for scanning microscope, as we know, it's very similar to the SEM. It uses pixel light to, uh, to a tiny spot and then runs the scan the samples. And if we have multiple detectors, we can detect signals from different channels. So this is just a beam line show up in the HXN line, uh, HXN beam line at the light source two. So the, all the extras have been focused to a tiny spot and then shining on the sample. And they have the fluorescent detector that gives the information about the element. We also have the, the transmissional detector, which detected the fully transformed the scattering signal from sample. It's kind of fully transform of your, of your sample information. By using this uh, fully transform, and as knowledge we have gained, we can retrieve the face. Right? We can also have another detector away from the, the beam pass. That's collect the signal from the bright diffractions. So for bright diffraction signals, we can decompose the, the strings, stress along certain direction inside the crystal. So because we can, more, um, we can collect Within the environment, we can get the combined information from the element to the uh, face and to the string. And the state of art uh, microscope, like uh, HXN, have a very high spatial resolution, about 11 nanometer. That's kind of a, a, a world leading record. So that's a real image of these beam lines. So this is a transmissional scattering. So this is a direct diffraction detector. This is a fluorescent detector. They all function at the same time. And this is just another image showing the high resolution of the, the, the light source to logo. And this is another test panel, the donut, about show the resolution of 11 nanometer between the, the gaps of these donuts. And for, and this is just a one example, very quick example, show the fluorescent signals about the, the materials. So, for this one, they can discriminate the nickel, magnet, cobalt simultaneous. This is a really advantageous compared to the previous transmission X-ray microscope. For transmission X-ray scope, what we need to do is that we need to decide which element it is first. Then scan the energy range, scan the X-ray with across the energy, then look at the oxygen states. But here, since they collect the, the fluorescent signal from all range of uh, energies and ranges. So they can discriminate what's the elemental it is. And they can do quantitative analysis about the composition. And this is another uh, example showing the, the, the in situ grow, uh, cor corrosion of a stainless steel in the acidic acer solutions. So this the stainless steel composed of uh, the chrome and nickel and iron. And similar to previous uh, molten salt part, we can see a uh, fast and mobile of chromium to the corrosion site. So we can see that uh, the enrichment of chromium, which is encoded by the red color, the enrich this one. And we can do additional uh, anal uh, quantitative analysis to see, see the propagation, the, di the dis spatial distribution of this chromium, and then get some idea about the diffusion rate of these chromiums on the crack part. On the crack part. And we can also do additional 3D quantitative analysis. So this is an ongoing project. We are looking at a mixture uh, of the gadolinium silver oxide and the copper of uh, ferrous oxide. So this system is uh, a, 
a very good ionic conductive for for fuel cell. So different components, people saying that the different components of this mixture will have different functions. The CGO, the gadolinium serum part, is more sensitive, is more conductive for ionic, like oxygen transform, transport. And the CFO, the cobalt iron oxide, is more electronic conductive. So people think that by combining these two together, the material will have both good conductivities in ion for oxygen ions and also good conductivity for electronics. So that's really key for achieve high performance for fuel cell, like the hydrogen evolution or carbon dioxide or carbon reduction. But when we, in reality, people really found that this combination, this combination of these two really have different performance in terms of the synthetic, uh, uh, synthetic procedure, like what temperature it is and what's the, the ratio of these two components. So by using the XRF tomography, we can analyze the individual components inside these materials. Actually, we found that apart from these two raw materials, there are additional two phases synthesized or, or formed during the, the high temperature sintering. That's what we call the, uh, we call the phase, uh, the emergent phase one and emergent phase two. And because all the individual voxels are quantified, so we can quantify the, the greens, the composition of each green, and look at the, the element distribution. Sorry, element distribution. And from, for each material like this one, there's so many greens, hundreds of greens, but we can quantify at the uh, same time, and we get a very good statistical analysis of each component about their composition distributions. More interestingly, we found that we have a new phase happen for the blue dots away from the evolution of your raw material, like the cobalt iron, this is raw material, and the, the apex here is uh, another raw material, get the BMC wrong side. This new phase really showing up gave us the idea about how the phase evolution happened phase transformation happened during high temperature synthesis. So more details will be viewed in the future publication. So I may not go to very details. The main concept um, I want to deliver is that the XRF quantitative analysis is really powerful to discriminate the phase. And we can also look at the, the, the spatial distribution of these two phases. The red one is one phase, the uh, green one is another phase, and they are formed in between of the raw phase, the CFO, the, C, the C, CFO, and also the GDC, the, the, the blue one. So we can see how they form spatially in the 3D volumes. So here, just another uh, few additional examples showing the, the XRF imaging for the bio cells and another solid electrolyte and also some uh, heterogeneous, uh, very complex composition particles with the, 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 the like a titanium magne magnesium aluminum doped this uh, cobalt oxide. So we can resolve it. the very individual components inside these uh, particles. And additional to the, to the fluorescent signals, we can also make use of the diffraction signals, like the black diffractions, which give sensitivity to the, the strings and stress of materials at different location. Like the, so these signals of deconvolution, we have a signal related to the, the bending of the crystal and signal to the stretching of the, this one. And a different, uh, this, this signal is sensitive to the twist of the crystal. So this kind of analysis, uh, uh, quantitative analysis, uh, will be covered by the next lecture by Dr. Xiao Jing Huang. So I will not go to detail at this moment. So I think uh, we are almost at the end of this uh, um, talk. So following in the following, I will just discuss some frontiers that we are facing and that we want to solve in the, uh, in the near future. 
So because of the development of a synchrotron, we have more and more flux of X-rays. That means uh, we can do the experiment faster. But uh, right now for the, for the image without lens, we really can achieve a sub-millisecond scale resolution. But for the TXM using lens, we can only reach kind of end of the uh, 10 millisecond or even uh, 10 millisecond scale resolution, uh, temporary resolution. So how can we reach even faster? Because uh, most of reaction, dynamic reaction happen at very short times. If we are able to capture this kind of uh, time stamp for this reaction, it's really uh, fantastic. We also need to develop quantitative analysis techniques, especially for the phase retrieval. Although there's a, a long development in the history and in the literature, but it's still an ongoing process to retrieve the phase more accurately, especially when we deal with a real image with noise. So for simulation, there's no problems. Our problem almost solved. But for in reality, the noise in the image really kill the signals. So how to uh, properly treat this noise and then properly retrieve the face. So that's another challenge. And another ongoing development is the diffraction contrast. So previously we can use the TXM to look at the, uh, the morphology of the, uh, the grains, but we don't understand, but we don't have idea about the orientation of the greens. Where is the 0, 1, 1 direction of plane with are the 0, 2, 2 or 0, 2, 1 point, for example. So people, I think, have developed some kind of diffraction contrast image to track the 3D green orientation. But this different contrast 3D green image is at a relative low resolution in micron scales. How can we further improve the resolution is another challenge. Then fully important is to the, after, not during the, for the experiment, but for, the, for data analysis. For 3D data analysis, we need to find out a more robust way to attract use, useful uh, quantities like the porosity, torturosities, and if we have a dynamic study, like in situ experiment, how can we track the dynamics in a 3D, uh, you know, 3D object? So this uh, involves a lot of development of algorithms. And also, as we said, the tomography reconstruction is also another challenge because directly applying the Fourier slice theorems doesn't uh, work. So there's a new algorithms developed during the times and also because we know that the X-ray is, uh, is, not, is, uh, is not good for human bodies. It's also not good for materials. Sometimes we see the beam damage of materials. So the idea that we want to reduce experimental times in the experiment, that means in the 3D measurement, we want to reduce the, the angular projection. Instead of uh, uh, having the projection at uh, uh, the thousand dollar projection, if we can reduce to 100 or even smaller, this will dramatically reduce beam damage. But with this smaller amount of data, how can we robustly reconstruct the 3D object? It's a challenge. And the people right now uh, think about the new idea about using machine learning based algorithms, but this is still at the baby uh, step. So, mature, we need a very mature and robust one that hopefully can come in the, in the near future. Uh, another one, another challenging is to back forward simulation to, to take into the account of extreme material interventions, not included in the refract index. Uh, because all the um, formula we derive or we have saw is based on the refraction index in the material, the N which have two components, the delta and the beta, corresponding to the phase component as the attenuation component. But there are additional components not covered by the, by the refining gas, like the structure. So different crystal have different scattering, especially if the crystal, the material is thick, there's a multiple scattering inside the material, make the, the beam, in the beam material more, much, much more complicated. So we need to, 
have more simulation to first understand this kind of interactions and then apply this knowledge into the real experiment data to find the, this to find this interaction and back calculate the properties of material like the 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 especially the green orientation inside them uh, your uh, crystal and uh, all these challenges are really related to a signal with the detection capability we have. The detection limit can be the fluorescent scattering, the black uh, diffractions, uh, and uh, the spectrons. So all and all these properties also lead to the temperature, the pressure in the environment. So there's a, a large room for development of the facility to well control all these parameters. So this is uh, the frontiers we are facing. And uh, I think there's a, a really a rapid progress in all the directions. And maybe in the next year, the next few years, if you have a, if you have a similar a lecture like this one, you will, you will hear new results. And uh, also for data analysis, we also have challenges in the, like the image segmentations, like, uh, if we have an image like this one, human for human eyes, we can easily think about, okay, this is a big green, this is a small green attached to this, but uh, how the algorithm work reliably is another, it's kind of a uh, difficult. So there's a traditional algorithms called word shard uh, segmentation, but also people have uh, uh, identified, uh, 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 think about the new machine learning based uh, uh, algorithms still ongoing. Okay, so up to now, we have some very basic idea. Hopefully you have some basic idea about the different image techniques and understand the, the, the application regime for each technique. So this really for, for you and for us to do research, I think the, the question is that how do we choose the technique? First, is the X-ray image is the right tool? Instead of X-ray, there's a additional like, uh, tools like electron microscope, the, the optical microscope, the IR, what are all other uh, electronic, micros electronic uh, measurement. So the question is whether X-ray image is suitable for your research. This is the first question we have. And the second is, uh, what's the feature size you want to see? That really depends on spatial resolution. Like the image without the lens, we can only reach the uh, resolution about in micron scale. But if you have uh, want to see the nano scale, you may resort to the the, the TXM uh, image, right? So it really depends on the, the feature we want to see. And also, is there any dynamic happen in your material? Do you need the time resolutions? And also, what kind of contrast do you do you need? Is it a soft material or hard materials? So it really depends on what kind of energy you want to use and whether you want to use the phase contrast or use the absorption contrast. Or otherwise, or other, do you want to use the fluorescent signals or, or scattering signals? So for some, some general guide are listed here, you can take home. Very basic idea for, for resolution between uh, below the, 30 nanometer, very high resolution one, you need to the scanning microscope. And if your resolution between, uh, between uh, 30 nanometers to kind of few hundred, uh, uh, few hundred nanometers, you can use a transmission extra microscope. Let's give a full field image. If you go to really large size, you go to projection based image, which means which uh, don't use any lens. And uh, if you really want to a high speed image, that means uh, you need more flux. For this, for this one, maybe we don't use the monochromatic X-ray beams. We use uh, a wide beam, which have very strong, which have, uh, which have uh, a combination of all the X energies of X-rays. They give a large, uh, very high flux. So this give, so using wide beam, we can use absorption contrast and the propagation based uh, mechanism uh, techniques. And if you have a very slow, very phase, like the tumor or human cells, so 
we can use the analyzer based technique or long distance propagation. So this give very sensitive to the, diff the phase gradient, give very good contrast. And if you want to quanti quantify the phase, then we can use a propagation based method, which is the inline holography. We take an image at different uh, several distance and by using the, the mathematical formula or uh, uh, other um, algorithm to retrieve the phase. So this is also achievable. And uh, also if a sample scattering a lot, we, can, we need to use the analyze based, te uh, based techniques. So, so all these guidelines are very basic and it really depends on your research purpose. So hopefully for after this lecture, you have some ideas. I know that there's a lot of mathematical insight and I do not explain very well, but uh, I think uh, afterwards you can read the literature cited in the lectures and go to details about the, about the application and about the theoretical part if you are interested. And I think uh, that's at my, my presentation. Hopefully you can gain some basic ideas. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you guys have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section. Uh, as of now, there are no questions, so we'll just wait a, a minute or two, and then uh, we'll see what happens. Is that all right? So anyone can share kind of your question about your application, for example, in terms of your research, if you have questions to see if it's applicable in actual imaging, definitely we can share some, uh, give some suggestions. All right. Um... There seems to be uh, no questions at this moment. So um, I guess we will just call it a day. Sure. And um, yeah, if you have any questions that you think of later on, you feel, always feel free to email me or email um, um, Mignon directly. Yes. Yep. And uh, just a reminder again, uh, there will be no lecture next week. So uh, if you do get the automatic uh, email that there's a lecture, just uh, please ignore that. And uh, that's it. We'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.